This is part two with Patrick Duffy, AKA Bobby Ewing and Frank Lambert. Part one is waiting for you in the podcast queue. Today, we get into detail about Step by Step, Suzanne Summers, Ellen, The Larry Sanders Show, Johnny Carson, Howie Mandel, and a lot of other people. He opens up about his insecurities, analyzes himself, and reveals a personal secret or two. I also ask him for advice, and you will hear his answer. I'd like to thank the Culver Hotel for hosting this taping. Patrick walked up the old staircase to our lounge, nestled in for an engaging conversation. And then when we were finished talking, we took fun photos, taking full advantage of the hotel's retro modern look. You can see those photos, plus a really fun mini trailer, about one minute or so, of Patrick and his career highlights that was created by my fabulous intern, Kaylee Marula on my Instagram. You'll find a link in today's show notes. And now part two with Patrick Duffy. Let's do it. This is the perfect segue into step by step because there you go. You're a master at this. You you? are. You just did it because you were talking about Victoria, but then it suddenly reminded me of Suzanne Suzanne. Summers, who, by the way, she was also on my show. And by the way, she became my Hagman. I know, and I heard you say that before, but I forgot actually to even say that at the beginning, you could have watched Suzanne's episode to get a feel oh, for. I could have, yeah. Yeah. Um, but she, we talked a lot about that of her being Chrissy Snow, right? And then leaving. And she was also somebody who left. Uh, yeah. And a, she got fried for leaving. Yeah. I mean. She Right, you didn't really get fried. No, no. But she got fried. Yeah. Well, because you know, and she talks about this, so yeah. it's not tales out of school, but um, they they poisoned the well there in terms of trying to renegotiate. She didn't want to leave. She, she and Alan demanded a renegotiation and the production, whoever they were that produced that show, didn't want to get pushed around that way. Mm-hmm. And so they didn't fire her. They ostracized her. They basically shunned her. Uh, she was no longer in those ensemble wonderful scenes in the living room of everybody falling over the couches and on the things yeah. and the pra- and all that. She had a two-walled set, a chair, and a phone, and they would call Chrissy. Oh, that's right. If now you, you say look that, at that, I remember. If you look at the last, she was away. Was she away? Well, yeah, she was always on a trip somewhere or doing something, oh. and they would call her. She would come in maybe one day out of the whole shoot. They would have that set up. The cameras would be locked off. She'd read her lines. So rude, like so blatantly. Yeah, yeah. So she she reinvented herself. She went to Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. She started honing her singing craft. She has a beautiful voice. She has a great style of singing. Um, Alan, you know, shepherded her through all that. And then she came back. We were still doing Dallas. She came back and did She's the Sheriff. Uh, which was a, I think, a one-season show. Okay. Uh, and then nothing crickets until uh, step by step. And literally, I walked in and met her the first day uh, on step by step, and I shook hands, and in my mind, I went, "Oh, you're my new Haggy." You're very lucky. I mean, it's very cool for that to happen. But yep. you know what? Uh, okay. It's not just luck then. I don't think there's that, something about you. There, and there's just yeah. the fortune of having finding the right people too. Yes, I both. I think yeah. there is there is the luck because right, you're not always even if you are that person and you come across that way and you emulate that and you yeah. know yeah. if you're not synced up to people who feel that and appreciate that and can give that back. Right. You could do it's it, not but sometimes happen. it's a lot of work. And when yeah. it's when it's really working, it's no work at all. Mm-hmm. And the same thing was true. We couldn't, Suzanne and I couldn't wait to get to the sound stage to do step by step. And instead of going to our rooms, we would sit in our chairs off camera and we would just talk all the time, just chat away. Like, and we'd see each other every day. And people would say, What do you have to talk about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's just, always and, stuff and, to and, talk and, about. And, yeah, it's yeah. like a quilting club or something. We were just hammering away at each other the whole time. Well, do you think if there was somebody other than Suzanne, like, would you have had that friendship? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, you know, falling in love with Linda. If if I had worked with her, I think it would have been the same. Are there so? Are there other? I mean, you've worked on other things, many other things too. I've had wonderful co-stars all the time, especially women. To uh-huh. be quite honest, I mean that goes with the territory of being typecast. 
you know, because of what I look like and the parts that I played prior. Um, so I, I worked, you know, the joke was I've worked with so many beautiful women, you know, uh, all of the Charlie's Angels, you know, and I actually went to bed with them all on the episode too, which oh, was wait, interesting. Really? Wait, you, what? You really were worked with every Charlie's Angel? Well, uh, that were on the show at that time. It was uh, Jacqueline Smith. Yeah. Uh, who fell in, her character fell in love with my character on the show. And then in the same episode, Cheryl Ladd's character fell in love with my character on the show. And we kept the affairs separate from one another. And then the only way they could resolve it, because the angels couldn't fall in love erroneously, right? So they had to kill me. So they killed me in order for them to both mourn the, the man they loved. You know, and then I, I, I did a TV movie with Linda Carter, Wonder Woman. And we fell in love and got married. And, and it was just, I've just met uh, Lonnie Anderson. You know, all, they're icons, every single every one of them. Every single one of them. It just goes on. And, and you got on. along with all of them. All of them. So that's you for sure. But I think that the friendship that you became best friends with Haggy. Haggy. And um, what did you call Suzanne? I forget. Do you have any? Suzanne? I always called her Suzanne. Oh, just Suzanne. Okay. Yeah. Nobody called her Susie or anything. Okay. Really, okay. Yeah. It was always <laughs> Suzanne. I hear you. So Suzanne and Haggy. Th those were because they were like that too. Right. And, and because I was with, I was with Hagman for the original 13 and then two more. So 15 years mm -hmm. working together. Uh, Suzanne was seven years in a row, you know, playing husband and wife who were madly in love with each other, you know, and sexually attracted to each yeah. other, which made seven kids on the show go, ew, <laughs> you know. But that was a great gig to go to. Also, like totally different from Dallas, but at the same time, it seems to me like you were happy at least with Suzanne oh for my God. sure. But the, and the kids on the show were like my children. And when the show was over, for years when the show was over, I would get Father's Day cards from them, from especially Stacey Keenan and, 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 and Christine Lakin. Um, I, I wrote a letter of recommendation. It wasn't why she got in, but I, I wrote a letter to get Stacy into law school, uh, you know, saying, yeah. you know, how, what a great person she is, how intelligent she is, how, you know, everything. Um, same with, with, uh, Christine, uh, I get baby pictures. I get, you know, they're like family. So do you think it's still possible to be like that now, or are we in a different era where people are, more transient and move on. Do you know what I mean? Well, first of all, there's something, what, the beauty was it happened from day one, but the, the longevity of the shows made it permanent in mm -hmm. your life. And shows just don't last that long anymore. No. A season sometimes is eight to 10 episodes and it's hard to get in that rhythm, you know? And it has to be a show that's joyful. And a lot of these shows that run like are zombie shows or you know, right. killer shows. Like and it's like, yeah. And it's just like, you know, spewing blood all the time. You know, do you want to go have a drink afterwards or you just want to get the blood off? Yeah. You know, so I don't know. I'm sure with the right combination of people and, and project. Yeah, you could. Yeah, because human nature is human nature. Yeah. But also some it's like, again, that protectiveness, almost what we started talking about earlier, right. which is like the people who you're working with have to have that lack of i don't know what that's interesting again i never thought of it this way until you brought that up with haggy and with suzanne there was almost no wall i did not have to edit uh, oh you didn't have to edit i didn't have you to didn't edit. Have the wall. i did not have to edit and uh -huh. i didn't have the wall then uh -huh. because there was you know i've known you now for I stopped wearing a watch when I went to Mexico. What does that tell you? That's awesome. Yeah. But, I, you know, I haven't known you that long. Yeah. But the sense that I had over time with, with, uh, with Linda and with Haggy and with Suzanne was I was completely safe. I could, they, they know my life. You know, uh, Linda and Larry were the only people that I told when I got cancer and, and went through that uh, just because I knew it would go no further than right there, mm -hmm. you know? And I wasn't that I needed to keep it a secret, but I, again, I just didn't want a thousand reporters wanting my comment on, you know, a procedure. Sure. So, uh, but there was no wall with those two. Mm. 
you know. So you knew right away you didn't need the wall. I didn't need the wall with him, you know. And, and there's no, that's the interesting thing about the wall that I hope people get, and I, I know you do because you're a shrink, is that it's not like I have secrets. It's not I'm protecting a secret uh, unless you use the other form of the definition of the word secret, which is to secret something. Okay. In other words, I want to have things that are precious to me that I protect, not because they're any different than anything that other people wear on their shirt sleeves in public. But I want those few things that are my treasures that I go back to. And, and so I secret them away. Yeah. Uh, but they're not really a secret because I'm not trying to keep people from discovering something. I just want, I want, I want to be able to lock my mental door and know I'm safe behind it. And I, and I do that. Yeah. I do that. So what are some of those things that you secret? <laughs> well, I, I don't even know. I, I, I can't. Well, uh, you know, broad strokes. Um, I would say I'm, I'm pretty insecure as a person. Uh, I, I will absolutely say that I am an uh, introvert. Um, I am most comfortable in my home or on whatever property I'm on um, without people, unless it's somebody my wife for 46 years, 47 years, or Linda. Um, but the joke I tell people, because I love being out. Is yeah. that, it's not oxymoronic. It's not. Um, I love being out, but when I'm out, I'm on. Mm -hmm. uh, and not exhaustively on, just I know that people have an impression and that I want to also, I want to give them the proper impression of who I am. So I, that's why I edit and, you know, I'm, I'm telling the truth. I'm just editing while I'm telling it, but you know, over the breakfast table with Linda, no, I don't edit, you know, right. with Haggy, I didn't edit. You know, we took so many trips together. We got so drunk together on a regular basis. We told each other everything. There was no secrets, mm -hmm. you know, Linda would observe the two of us and she'd say, Oh boys you know they, you know yeah and when the three of us would travel it was like mother and then these two crazy guys sure you know? sure but we we would sit in our hotel room when we would take trips you know we'd go to europe together and all these things usually for work and and, and not long work but four days in germany you know yeah and they they pay you a whole bunch of money That's and nice. and you don't have to memorize lines you know it's all that kind of stuff so what do you do well, you just go out and find bistros and, and Hofbrows and yeah. drink beer and chat. And then you go to your room and, and every, instead of people going to Linda's room, Larry's room and my room, we'd all meet in Haggy's room. And we'd, he and I would empty the mini bar, you know, and then we'd order hamburgers at three in the morning. And it was so joyful. Yeah, you're really lucky to have experienced that yeah. in that way and yeah. have been open to it at that time exactly. as well and to appreciate it now. It, it just was meshed. It was perfect. So it's interesting that you say that you're an introvert too. And I believe you, by the way, I'm not saying that you're not, but it is, I think a lot of people who are introverts don't come across as introverts. Yes, I think so too. And also because it is like where you derive your energy, right? So you do need to, uh, be away from everything and people and whatever to get your energy back. And that's normal. Right. Um, but it's also interesting because you made such good friendships. So you're able to still be extroverted in some way enough to connect with the people that yeah. you've connected with. And I'm not falsely connecting with right. them. That's the, I want to re emphasize that is that I'm not playing a character. Mm -hmm. I, I am me. I'm just the me that's kind of expected to be me, uh, but hopefully not shallow. You know, uh, you know, I have, I'm like that Al Franken character on Saturday Night Live, Deep Thoughts. Yeah, with, uh, what were deep, what was, deep Thoughts with what? Was it Paul Baldwin or is that somebody different? I'm deep so, Thoughts, right. I'm so and so, and because you deserve it or something right. like I forgot. And that. I like me or and something like, like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> right. I forget his character name, but so, you know, I, but you come across as authentically, yeah, for I, sure. It is me. I mean, yeah. It is me, and it's a, it's authentic. Yeah. It's just, I, I know that I, I'm i not guarded is not the right word. I'm just, I'm aware. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm with the people that I'm completely comfortable with, I don't have to be aware because I know 
that whatever comes out is exactly who they know. Yeah. And you're safe. And I'm safe. But also about being insecure. I think a lot of people will be surprised about that, but I think that everybody is insecure. I think they are too. I think you would be hard pressed to show me somebody who's not insecure, okay. no matter how they come across. That's true. That's true. We all are. Yeah. And I, you know, and that's one of the first things I told Linda when we got together. You, know, I said, you don't understand how insecure I am. Are you sure you love me? <laughs> Did she believe you? Yeah. Well, yeah, she knows. You know, every morning it's like, it's me again. Is it okay that I'm here? <laughs> I'm starting to get a little more relaxed about it. Right. Actually, we bought a house in Mexico. So what does that tell you? Uh, but um, yeah. So you're insecure about like anything or people, how people feel about you or what? Um, well, uh, th this is another thing uh, is I'm insecure around people that not only that I admire, but that I stand in awe with a little a uh, at their capabilities and at their intellect and at their oh, okay. grasp of things. And I don't think of myself as being extremely intellectual or, or you know, I certainly don't have a, a business sense. So, you know, that, that's way out of my wheelhouse. Um, so I'm, I'm always a, a, a bit insecure of being found out, uh -huh. you know. So, so like imposter syndrome. Yeah, so I don't, well, is that what it's called? That the is imposter what it's called. syndrome? Okay, oh, and, dear God. And everybody, not everybody has imposter syndrome. No, but, I'm not going to say everybody, but, but it's, it's so, it's common. Yeah. It is common. And, and it's not debilitating. It doesn't, you know, I'm not a recluse. Mm -hmm. I just really enjoy quietude. Um, uh, I'm not antisocial. I just enjoy small relationships with special people. Um, you know, if you said, which five people would you like to dinner? I'd, I'd stop at three and go, Duh, I don't know who else. Yeah, that's oh, really? Much it. Who were the three? Well, I don't know. I was, oh. I was, I was, I was throwing it against the wall and see if it would stick. And obviously <laughs> it did. You, you jumped on it like, oh my God, <laughs> this is like fishing. I just go, dweeb. And I say, oh yeah, she bit. Okay, on. we'll reel her in now. I think you've caught a lot. Yeah. I think you've got, I've bit on a lot. Yeah. But, uh, so. Anyway, mm -mm. That's, that's who I am. That's the human experience, though, yeah. right? It, well, it's and the the, the correlating one is no, more often than not, not always. Really great comedians are are troubled people. Are they have a sad part of them that uh -huh. somehow has compensated and makes them do comedy, you know, especially stand up. People, yeah, you know. So there's there's all of those yin and yang, Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. kind of things about human nature, which I think makes us really interesting. Very fascinating. Yeah. So the comedians thing is definitely a thing, I think. And it is like already, I guess people realize that at this point that a lot of comedians do have that like sadness well, or whatever. Unfortunately, we see the news a lot of times when yes. it's taken to the extreme and we lose them. That definitely is true. Yeah. Um, I've interviewed a few comedians on the show too. And I prepare myself in advance now that the comedians are going to be very serious. Yeah. And, and they can be cutting. They can, they can, it's death by a thousand cuts. You know, you can sit for an hour with somebody and they, you go away and you go, I'm bleeding all over. How did that happen? You just, <laughs> the, tickle, 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 you know? You yeah. know, it's hard for me to, I just talked about this with somebody the other day. Like when I'm listening to a podcast and it's a comedian who hosts it and then there's a comedian as a guest, that's another thing entirely too. Yeah. That's like the competition of who can be funnier. And it's uh, really like impossible to listen to yeah. personally. Well, that's what, when you said, oh, you've got your, your humor that gets you through. When I'm talking to anybody who does comedy, the humor thing of me just, the, it goes clang oh. because I don't want that yes. observation to be made of, oh, they're, they're trying to one up each other. And, I'm, and the same is true about business. I know I'm not a businessman. I know I'm not a comedian. I have a sense of humor, but when you're around comedians, that's uh, a different species. Mm. I'm, I'm not going to go toe to toe or even attempt it. Uh, so yeah, interesting. And I don't. I mean, it's, I, I guess they have fun doing it or whatever. I think so too, because it's it's a repartee. It's a, yeah. It's like fencing. Right. Or playing you know? tennis with somebody yeah, who's really yeah. good like, and, and like you, raising your oh, game. Oh, good shot. Oh, that's great. Yeah. You know? Right. I mean, I'm, the insecure part comes. I go. 
did you really mean that? Did you mean to hurt my feelings? Right. Oh, no. You know? Right. Don't tell me you don't like my shoes. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it so funny that like the human brain, like what we do, we're constantly thinking about ourselves and are we good enough and how we come across and like just well, it's, it's, it's a constant. It's how I got dressed to come and do this interview. I didn't just throw on what was in the closet. Everything was a conscious choice. Of course. I'm going to be on camera. I know who I'm talking to. I know what she looks like. I think, I want to, how do I want to look? I want to wear this. Or should I do the button up? I shouldn't do the button up. Well, yeah, I should do the button up. Should I wear a t shirt? I should not wear a t shirt. Linda, what do you think? Should I wear a t shirt? Should I not wear You know, it's like, just go to the yes. interview. So at least it's not just me. I don't want to, I can't even tell you how many how much time I put into like, well, what am I, what's the room going to look like? What am I going to wear? I try to dress also for the person that I'm Is this I'm your Bobby with. outfit? <laughs> this is my Bobby outfit. Yeah. All right. We should have the theme music now. Dun, 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 dun. But yeah, I mean, I do. I try to kind of, what's the vibe of the person? Right. And like, what's, what's, and I just kind of know intuitively what I feel that person right. is. Yeah. I'm thinking about the room and everything else. And yeah, there's so much time. So bringing it back to Ed Asner, okay. one question I asked him once when I interviewed him the first time. I saw time. a clip of him being interviewed by you. Oh. So what was the question? Which one? Was that the well, one? I'm, uh, he, he, it looked like he was sitting in a, in a, in a, 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 a theater yeah. seat. Yes. Yeah. And, and he, you asked a question, because I, I worked with Ed, and, and we were on the board of directors of Screen Actors Guild together. So we got to know each other pretty well. And I watched him look at you, and I thought, Oh, that's interesting. I wonder if that he thought he, something's going on in his mind about not. And I don't remember the question. So this is hypothetical where he's thinking either that was kind of a dumb question. How am I going to work around that? Or if they, there was a moment I saw in his face. I thought, I wonder what's going to come out of that. You're right. And I'm going to walk you through that. Okay. So first, I'll give you a little backstory that I interviewed Ed before I started taking video for the show, which I remember I told you at the yes. beginning. I only started that about a year ago. So this was just a podcast when I went to his home. We did a full interview. So he then, this was in L.A., Later, like maybe a year later, he was doing a play reading in New York. So this is where you saw that okay. video taken. So I went to see his play reading. So it reading. proves I did do my research. You sure did. And it's that was quite a little video. So we had already arranged it ahead of time that I would take a little video, maybe five minutes, just to share something on social media, not do another full interview. So I propped up my video camera and I thought, hmm, what am I going to ask Ed? And so here's what I asked. Before I tell you that, let me just say, in this play reading, there were just some actors on chairs just reading from a script. Sure. Ed, incredible. I mean, the acting chops that he has at the age he is, I think That's he's 91 why now. He's got those chops. Holy cow. I mean, from him sitting in a chair, half the time it looked like he was sleeping when right. it wasn't time to, for him to read his line. When it was time for him to read his line, I could feel what his he was doing or he, who he was being in my whole body. That good he is. That's how good he is. So anyway, that's just a little side story. So after the reading, I propped up the camera and I said, if there was a movie made yes. about you, who would you want who to would play? play you? So Ed, just very deadpan, looks at me, yawns. I know. I saw that. That's what made me think he's that's a comment. He didn't really yawn. He went. Mm. It was so brilliant. But at the same time, as I said, he did look like he was sleeping the rest of the play. But it was a comment. And then he was, I feel like he was thinking of an answer because then he said, Cary Grant. And then he looked at me with this like, yeah, wink. Yeah. And that was his answer. Yeah. So good. Right. What was the point of me bringing up Ed? There was something about, I forget. We're not going to remember. Um, I like that about your interview technique as well. What's that? You don't have a, a list of questions on your lap. You're not shuffling through cards while I'm answering the last question, like what the hell is, you know, that kind of thing. It I just kind of rolls, that. so it's cool. I anyway. could not do that. This is why I just want to have a conversation. Okay. But I'll, I'll tell you a little secret. I think secret. that's also your training as a therapist. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it, it is a question of, well, it, this could be happening at a cocktail party where a lot of hug and mug is going around in the room and we happen to be sitting across from each other and what do you do i'm a therapist oh that's interesting yeah. what do you do? I'm a therapist. Oh, how about that and then all of a sudden you're you know an hour has gone by and you've had a, a really illuminating insight into another person 
that's it. Yeah. You again, that's you hit it right on the head. That's what I love to do. So okay. I just naturally do it. So okay. it's not even, I'm not planning like this is what the kind of thing we're going to talk about or right. even this is the kind of conversation we're going to have. I just naturally want to get to know you and that where our conversation is going, where it's going, where it's going and I'm forgetting things. You know, sometimes I'll forget something that I should have asked. Well, sure. And that's a bummer. But it's not as big of a bummer as if I didn't really have a real conversation with no. you. No, and I think from what I've seen of your stuff, that's what comes across. Mm, I know, hope so. Which is great. So I hope it comes across to you as you're talking to me. Oh, yeah. Also, not just as a viewer. I haven't looked at my watch once. Okay, that's good. Because you'd look at it and be like, why am I still talking to her? I've said everything I know. Right. But believe me, we could never run out of things. No, I don't think so. I, I, I actually enjoy the process of an interview. Uh, especially if it's more free form. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I like interviews too. Believe it or not, I also like being on the other end of it. Oh. I don't mind it. I think Well, you're being interviewed a little bit now. I'm I'm sort of getting a little You insight. are. Are you trying to? I'm editing. <laughs> you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to spin it around a little bit. She just, won't notice. Let's just see if uh talked about her thing. Yeah. But I don't even mind. Like I don't I yeah. like that. So I would have to say I can go back to most of the interviews that I've enjoyed the most. And it is where the my guest has come back to me. And, right. it, and that's how I know that we're connecting. Right. You know what I mean? That to me is like, then they don't feel like it's just an interview. You're right. I hate it when they feel like it's just an interview. Oh, I know. Well, and that's... I'm but showing no other you my word. insecurities. There's no other word. But is it, uh, you know, it, it's a conversation, an in-depth conversation. Yeah. It and doesn't sound as... Like, those aren't good How about a therapy words. session? Right. It could be a therapy session. I should lay down, put my feet up, right? Well, people have cried, and one of them is Suzanne Summers. Oh, really? She did at the end, and she su surprised herself. She said, I don't know why I'm crying, but I think that we had gotten into some emotional things. Oh, yeah. So, um, and she was very open. And it's funny because I'll tell you that the truth is I didn't feel like she was saying anything to me that she hadn't said to everybody else before, which, you know, it's fine. She's written her books and everything. So at the end, when she did cry and she surprised herself, that to me was also like you were saying Ed had a message. Right. That was a message to me. Right. That something had happened within the interview. And I really appreciate that. She was that. acting. <laughs> so darn. I've seen her do that a hundred times. Shoot. Yeah. I never saw Chrissy Snow cry like that. Yeah. No. She, she'll cry. She can cry at a hat rack, you know, so it had nothing to do with you at all. Darn. I have to go. I want to see how insecure you are. I am, but I'm going to, I'm showing you all my insecurities okay. right now. So my insecurities are the biggest one is that whoever I'm talking to isn't going to really feel a connection with me. Oh, is it true? Mm. Well, okay. What do you make of that doc? I think it's, it's why you have the personality on camera that you have right now is that you you break down the ability to stonewall by being completely vulnerable and i i don't know if it's a a, a premeditated thing or a instinctual thing that uh, it protects you from disappointment because if you're your personality on camera you know the, the environment reflects us one way or the other, you know, a person can walk into a room and the whole room goes, wow, or the whole room goes, oh, shit, you know, it can be either way. Sure. So depending on what you project, the environment will respond in kind. And I, I you've done this enough, obviously, and yeah. I think the therapy thing also helps, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how I don't know how people get the other person on the couch to open up that way. And I'm sure it doesn't happen on, you know, interview one. It's it's a learned trust, but it's also a learned procedure that you now instinctually know how to be self-effacing so that somebody is comfortable make leaning forward in an interview. Yeah. As opposed to that's right. Leaning backwards. You know, so that's it's it's part of that human nature that I find makes us interesting. Yeah. How do you get out of another person what you desire? You know, half of it is premeditated. The other half is purely instinct. 
it's it happens on a millisecond by millisecond communication you know it's the look in the mm -hmm. face it's a cock of an eyebrow and mm -hmm. a, you know it's a a laugh or a giggle or a you know a dropping of some sort of guard at, at a brief moment yes you know a peak on on the other side of the veil you know all those things make it a push me pull you kind of conversation as opposed to question answer question answer right and, and you've you're very accomplished at that well, thank you. It's funny you say that because I'm actually giving, I'm speaking at a conference in a couple of days. I'm headed to Nashville tomorrow. Okay. Speaking at a podcast conference on the science behind interviews. Now, I didn't decide to do this. Somebody asked me to do it. He's going to interview me and I'm talking about the science behind interviews. Now, like you said, I don't think about what I'm doing. It is totally, I'm, I'm running on instincts. That's it. I'm intuitive and I'm running on instincts in the middle of the conversation. So when he said it's going to be the science, I was like, the science? I don't really do the science. And he's like, well, you have that therapy background, right? You did go to school and learn. Oh, yeah, that's true. And then I had to actually piece together what I learned in grad school as a therapist. Just use whatever's on this camera. Sit in a chair, smile like that and play this. And there's your there's your lecture. There's your right? lecture exactly. right there. But that's right. But it's just to me, it's just what we're doing well, is just what we normally what I normally like to do. But I don't think everybody's that confident. OK, you know, uh, I have a, you know, and I, I did the Carson show, you know, maybe 15 times and all those other talk shows over the time. And I know Johnny did homework, but. Every time I was on the show, he never once referred to, well, first of all, I never went on the show to sell anything. I didn't write a book or I don't have a yeah, new thing coming out. Yeah, that's so much out better. So, yeah. I, you know, basically I did the show when I was doing Dallas. So I knew we were going to talk about Dallas. Sure. And I did the show when we were doing Step by Step. I knew we were going to talk about Step by Step. So neither one of us prepared anything. And we just chatted. And it was so refreshing. But he did have cards for other mm -hmm. guests. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. So he, yeah, I thought that's un I thought that's unusual. Like I thought for late night shows, maybe not then, but late night shows they pre-produce everything. Oh yeah, and they all have their little cards. Yeah. And Letterman took it to the point where he would throw his cards, <laughs> you know, through the window and the, all of that right. kind of stuff. So he made a comment on it. You know, most people they try and hide them, uh -huh. you know, because you know you're going to cut away to the person answering the quick take look at the thing, and they put down. And you go down. Yeah. Well, to me, everything is in this. Of course it is. It's not on a card. I know. So I have to feel it. And I'm always constantly trying to feel it. But the hardest thing is when somebody is on the other side and that's just, they're not even going to try that. That's just not what they're well, there for. If, if you watch every once in a while, I can't recall who it is, you know, but I've seen it over time. When somebody bombs on Carson's show, he's ruthless. I mean, he, there's a reason he was on for 20 some yeah. years or something. You know, he'll roll with anybody who's giving what he wants the show to project to the audience. Sometimes he gets a yes, no answer. Somebody who's either deer in the headlights, scared or just mm -hmm. not forthcoming. And this just thing happens. And I don't know whether he's got a button under the <laughs> desk or something, but he gets a signal from Freddie and he goes, we have to cut away for a commercial now. We'll be right back. Oh, Doc and Doc plays. They cut back and the chair is empty. The person is over there and he introduces the next guest. That makes sense. I've heard, I heard Howie Mandel telling a story about basically that kind of thing happened to him, I think. Oh, yeah. After he was going on with Carson and he had some bit and he was like a last minute replacement or something. And then Carson did not like his bit. And he basically said goodbye yeah. and like cut to somebody else. Yep. And he was never invited back on the show. Yeah, yeah. that's the other thing. That's brutal. But I don't know how you could go on to a show like that relaxed if you know that that could happen. Yeah. But I guess I, you realize you had a good I had a good relationship rapport, with yeah. him. And it, he would invite me back on purpose. He, he asked me to co-host. Uh, so I subbed for him once. Mm -hmm. That was the most frightening moment of my life. To What was that like? It was the most frightening moment of so my life. So you did a whole show? A whole show. I came out with a da 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 The curtain opened and I walked out. And I sat in the Carson seat. And I did the interviews with the people. And, it's, and it was like. Oh my God. Do you remember who you interviewed? Uh, yeah, Bill Shatner. They asked me for people and, oh. I, and uh, who I was comfortable okay. with. Freddie de Cordova was fantastic that way. And uh, so I had Bill on. We had fun. I, I had a singer. Who did I have on? 
maybe one of the Mandrells. I don't know because they were. I don't remember. I was. But you just remember being nervous. I was brain dead nervous, brain dead nervous. And that was it. You never wanted to do it again. Oh, I would have. I wanted my own show after that. Oh, you did. Oh yeah. I wanted See? to do a show like that. It's Carson fun show. to interview people. Well, and it's fun to you know the British have the term "take the piss out of yourself." Uh huh. And that's what I liked about his show over the years because he would he would interact with people you know on the side you know like the guy who always came with the animals uh -huh. you know that guy you know and it always was fun or he would do skits you know he was the late night movie guy and he was you know he played all these things all making fun of himself and the characters he played and I always thought that would be the most fun yeah the most fun or host a show like the Carol Burnett show where you just come out, you host, and then you do skits just have fun. and plays and have fun. And be different people, kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. Well, I like having a show personally. So well, I, I, I feel it. It's great. Yeah. Um, do you, is this going to get bigger? So here's where I am now. It's, it's a good question. So I, I'm at that kind of launching pad, I think. Yep. And I need to decide what to do from here. So... I could ask you for some advice. Like, do I hire staff, production, da, 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 marketing, and launch it bigger? Or do I try to sell it, sell the show to some sort of a streaming network or something? Mm. Do I try to find myself a manager? Right yeah. now, I know that I'm at a turning point. And I have to decide what comes next. Yeah, there's a next step. Yeah. After four years. What yeah. should it be? Well, because you're now in your second step. You know, the first was your audio. Right. And now you're done the visual thing. Correct. You know, so I, I don't know. And I don't know anything about this section of the business, mm -hmm. you know, how it works or, you know, how things grow out of that. Uh, my My observation would be, you could take a show like this and make it a, a drama version of what you do. In other words, you could play yourself, but play the character that you are when you do this. Oh, it's like a scripted thing, you mean? Well, a scripted, but then it goes, it's scripted and non-scripted. There, there is a scripted lead in, but then it always ends with a real interview, with a real session. But what goes into the making of that session and right. how, you know, how screwed up are you as a person <laughs> before you get to the sit down interview? You know, oh, so it's me. So it's almost like the Larry Sanders show. Yeah, almost. it's almost like the Larry Sanders show. Got it. Okay. Because a I, I, other than the Ellen show originally, but not her, not her talk show. Mm -hmm. but her, oh, yeah. Her, the her first show. I've not really seen other than the Larry Sanders show um, that melding of the real personality and then taking that real personality and just tweaking it a little bit uh, to yeah. show the back story to show the list of people you want to interview you know and oh no god I, all right i watched this interview on carson he's deadly yeah i'm gonna look like shit in that interview no we can't use him he's the only one available and he's oh you know and then it's this that we see so it, yeah, that's right. that is i'm so glad you're here Oh, I, I've been wanting to book you for ages. I know it. I've done the research. You were in <laughs> right, my cards. Jungle Cruise, <laughs> you know. So anyway, I don't know hmm. uh, because I, it's not my. Yeah, it's not your forte not or my your bailiwick, zone. But, um, but I think there's definitely the next step, you know. And also there's the next step. If you look at late night, I was going to say name two, name one woman who chairs late night right now. Right. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know, but I don't I don't watch the late night shows because yeah. it's not my, it's the opposite of but me. But what I'm just saying is that that central figure in this type of format, um, there's no visual uh, example of that in mainstream television right now. Uh -huh. There's no, you know. And it doesn't mean a sit down interview like a Carson show or, a, you know, any of those Stephen Colbert, any of that. But this version of that with a female. But during primetime, late night, 
Mm, interesting. Okay, so now that gives me something else to chew on. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, it's true. They're all men. And I sometimes think to myself, it's like inside the actor's studio, only much more fun and relaxed and real yeah. and less rehearsed. And of course, James Lipton was a man too. And yep. you know, Letterman has the new show on Netflix, which is my next guest needs no introduction. Right. It's still Letterman, but it's like an in-depth. Yeah. Or that guy, Xenophilus, who did Between the Poems. Oh, Zach Galifianakis. Yeah. He's so funny. Yes. Yeah, so right. another guy. Yeah, so so the question is, I don't want to waste all your time asking about my, my next step, but right, so the question is, think of an idea and pitch it to... Yeah. That's what you think it is, rather than me just trying to get a job hosting another show. Yeah, first of all, you have the most awesome sizzle reel you can imagine. You know, you could put together a four to five minute yeah. thing that shows you at your best, the people you've worked with, and and then pitch the next step in this. Let's yeah. take this there. Okay. Okay, I'm taking that with me. You can do it. I mean, I, I, you'll, you'll write me a letter can I get Five a, years a recommendation from you like you did for the law school application? Well, <laughs> I Patrick will, Duffy endorses this idea. When you write your memoirs, I'll do one of those blurbs on the back. Yes, yes. Oh, I oh, had you so much t fun talking to Kara back in the day. You won't do the whole uh, uh, prologue or whatever for me? Oh, you won't no, do the I'm whole book gonna, introduction? In a, no, I'll just do that oh, little okay, thing. Okay, okay, okay. I'll write that down now. Yeah, because, you know if I'm alive when that happens, then we'll have to see. Look, I'm gonna, I'm ready to do it. So well, now it's like you've got me committed. Somebody asked me what this interview was going to be. Yeah. And I said, I think it's an interview where she'll find anybody that's still alive. <laughs> and that By the way, I'm very picky with who I book on the show, just so you oh, know. Okay. I basically hand pick almost everybody who's on the show. And it's because I, I feel like I see something and I think it's the intuitive nature of me, maybe the therapist or something. Well, I feel like I can sense people and I feel something and somebody interests me. This is who I'm inviting on my show. So sometimes I'll do favors for other people and I'll accept other people on the show or whatever. But for the most part. You're the perfect response to the question, if you could invite five people to dinner, who would they be? Because you have a Rolodex of potential people yeah first of all that you've done but also that instinct of oh i'd really like to sit across from that person yeah for an hour or two believe me you were a big score for me because i really when i was like oh you know patrick duffy so i reached out to your people um who's he, your manager I yeah, think? yeah your manager right so i reached out again and it's like yeah i just know i can see the name because i've seen you before and i just know I'm going to like this person. Oh, okay. And I'm not always right, but I think for the most part, I'm pretty darn good at yeah. judging. Well, that's part of, that must be part of, again, your training as a therapist to be able to look at or hear, you know, this palette and then be able to go, I'm going to start with the brown. That maroon brown, that's the key. There's the opening. That's the portal. So tell me about the thing. Boom. And right, you're right. on the inside. And it's like a yeah. it's like a suspense movie. I'm on the inside. I'm on the inside. I'm moving now towards the goal. You know. And you never know where the portal you never know. No. That's the that's yeah. the fun part of it. All right. So I'm gonna ask you my last question. And I'm I'm already thinking in my head. So I guess I do a little thinking in my head like you do. Okay. And I'm thinking in my head because I know that we spoke for a while, but there's nothing in here that I would want to cut. So this is going to be, I think, a two-part episode. This is going to be a 10-hour special. <laughs> oh, then we have to keep talking oh, about it. Like yeah. so, um, so I'm going to ask you my final question. Are you nervous? No. Okay. Because <laughs> you look at me like, hmm, okay, what's coming? If I go, uh, my answer. <laughs> That's my sign. Yeah. What's the image people have of you, and how is it different from who you really are? And who is the real Patrick who Duffy? Is the real Patrick Duffy? Well, working backwards, I think, the, well, the first, the full definition of who is Patrick Duffy will be decided when Patrick Duffy stops. Because, you know, we're constantly not reinventing ourselves, but we're, we're adding patina. And, and so we do change. Sure. 
Um, so who I am now is different than who I was 25 years ago um, and who I'll be, you know, 10 years from now. So that question, I, I don't know. Um, who, who I am at this moment, um, how I would describe myself is basically mm -hmm. what you want mm -hmm. to think, which we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm, I would describe myself as having more potential than I've yet been able to um, uh, exhibit or, or uh, maybe not even exhibit. I have put, because potential means that it's not there yet. Uh, and I say that because I think the best acting work I ever did was in a play in London in 2001. And I'd been acting, you know, up right up until that man for 30 years, right? Uh, and I went into the rehearsals of this play determined and confident to do it exactly the way I'd done my acting for the previous 30 years. I'm facile. I know my business. I, I'm adequate as an actor. Um, I memorize well, uh, um, all of those things. And I went in pretty much prepared. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do it that way. This little director woman looked like Shirley Temple. I mean, and I just, went, my first impression was, oh, she's so cute. She looks like Shirley Temple. Okay, I'm going to do the part the way I said. She changed my whole attitude about the craft that I had dedicated my life to. She changed my work ethic. She changed my, she gave me permission to do things that I never felt I had permission to do before. Um, my wife said at the end of the run, she, uh, my wife was uh, uh, in the business too, so she knew not to jinx anything. Um, she once told me in the middle of the run, she said, I have some things I want to tell you about your performance, but I won't tell them until we're on the way home from London, and which was smart because yeah. then you just think about no, it and then you right. screw them up, right? Um, but this director changed everything. So that was the potential I walked in with, even though I thought I was going to do it another way. Mm -hmm. Who I am now is I, I think I have that potential still. Uh, and it needs the right environment to trigger it to come out. Mm -hmm. So that's who I think I will be. I think I probably have one more time at bat, one more time at the plate, uh, you know, to do something significant. I mean, I think I'll sporadically always work as long as I stay healthy yeah. and I, I take care of, you know, how I look. They always want a grandpa, you know, now I play grandfather parts, Yeah. you know, but my, my history has preceded me. So I'm all, I'm known as a good guy, you know, as an actor, mm -hmm. he, he, he plays redeemable characters, you know, an audience looking at him goes, oh, that's Bobby. Yeah. Oh, everything's going to be okay. Yeah, and it's that kind true. Of so those are the parts 90% of the time I get. And it doesn't mean I want to play bad guys, but I think there's a, a depth of work that I hope I get the chance to see if the potential is mm -hmm. realizable. I might have coined a word, but... Um, that's kind of where I'm at right yeah. now. Yeah. So how do you get to, how do you find that then? Like, cause you, you have it, you know, you have it. So it's just a matter of matching the opportunity, with, right? To, with the to your ability and desire. But it, fe it seems like it would be kind of like how, like, where do I find it? Where is it? Is yeah. it here? Is it there? Is it well, there? I've, I've, if there's one thing I've learned at least about myself in this business is I've, I've never sought out work. Okay. And, I th and th that might be an insecurity issue in that what if I work for two to five years on a project that I, it's my passion. This is what I want to do. I'm going to make this movie no matter what. And then you end up finally getting it made and it just sucks. That would suck. As opposed to I get offered this job. I do it. Oh, that was interesting. And every once in a while, you know, a plum drops. That's perfectly ripe. Um, so I tend to rely on that maybe too much, mm. um, but it has served me. Um, it has served me so far. Uh, I, when, when you ask somebody the question, you know, what question do you get asked that you hate the most? You know, and I thought, I thought he was going to say, other than that question you just asked me, uh -huh. what, you know, what it would be. Um, but I get asked a lot, well, because I think of my career, the, the, the the longevity of it. What 
thing do you want to do more than anything right now? What's, what's the part that you think? And I honestly say, I don't know. I don't seek those things. I've never, when I was the right age, I never wanted to play Hamlet, you know? I, and now I'm the right age, I don't want to play Lear. Hmm. Um, I, have, I don't have that kind of wish list. I want to work, definitely. Um, and then every once in a while, somebody will, uh, I'll do something that makes that particular job the special one. And, and so that's, that's where I'm at right now. But there is that one thing, even though you don't know what it is. Oh, I think there's one out there. You know it's there it's and there. it's coming to you. Do you feel like it's, do you believe it's coming I to you? I feel that it will come to me if I demand it so. Uh-huh. How do you do that? Oh, well, I, I put it out there in the zeitgeist, but uh, also, which is interesting because I know you've done your homework. Not once did you bring up the fact that I've been a practicing Buddhist for 50 years. Oh, I, you know, I had that on my mental to I'm sure mention you did. list. Yeah. So part of that is creating the causes for the effect that mm -hmm. you desire. And I've lived my life that way for 50 years. Um, so I don't chant, you know, with this goal in mind of I want that part, but I chant to truly in my heart be satisfied with the work that I do. And so that's what I send out there. And then I want the environment to then say, well, here's, you have this choice, try this, you know, an offer to do something. And then I get in there, I think, wow, I never would have asked for that. Yeah. You know, which was the play in, in London. I, I was asked to do that very same play uh, two years before. And I said, I'll do it if I can play this particular part. The, it's a play called Art and it's a three-hander. It's just three guys. Um, and I, there are three totally different personalities. And me thinking I knew who I was as an actor, I said, I wanna play that part. So yeah, I'll do it if I can play that part. They said, no. We, we want somebody else to play that. We want you to play this part. And I turned it down. Oh. Two years later, I got asked by the same company, the play was still going on in London, would you do art for us this time? And that time I just thought, I wanna to go to London. I wanted somewhere in my career to have been on the West End in London. Sure, of course, that's no a good what, thing. You know, even if I'm doing, you know, whatever, Cinderella, I don't care. But I want to be on the West End. So I said, yes, I'll do it. And they said, we want you to play that part, though. And I went, OK. And it was the best thing of my entire acting career. Hmm. The most satisfying. My wife said it was the best work I had ever done. And that's what she told you later after. It, yeah. Oh, OK. And then she pointed out things that I consistently did every night in the show. Uh -huh. And she was a dancer, so it was almost like choreography. She would say, you exactly the same moment, the same night, you would take your foot and just go and put it like that. And had she told me that in the middle of the run, I would have been thinking, yeah. this is the moment to yeah. put the foot out. Here it comes. Okay. Oh, I'm crossing the leg now. They must love that. And then I would have killed it. Would have ruined everything. I would have ruined everything. Right. So, but that was, so my feeling is, if I want it and I'm sincere enough about it, something will happen. Mm -hmm. And I need to I need to be open enough to accept that something might be it, even though I don't recognize it as so. Do it and then discover it later. Mm -hmm. Why not? Isn't it funny? Because it can go either way. Like you can kind of look back and hear people's stories of I knew that wasn't right for me, but I took it. So it's like, that's the flip side of it. It's like, you may think something is wrong and then you look back and say, oh, I knew it, I should have listened to my gut or whatever. And then the other part of it is be open because you don't know what it's gonna exactly. be. And, and the, I think the lesson we learn, it, it's hard for some and maybe not hard for others, is even the worst decision you make is the best decision. Yes. It's, I mean, I have it's learned more from my mistakes than, than from my successes, mm -hmm. you know, to be just to say, even in my behavior, which I will not tell you. Okay. <laughs> please, please. Come because on, you I, know I, I, need to I know. can't even recall what it might be, but yeah. I remember the feelings of, oh, I do not want to be that person. That's not who I want to be. Why did I say that? You know, it, a, a flip remark or just something that, Mm. didn't land the way I wanted it to land. And I could see on the person's face that like me, they were, I hit an insecure button and, and now I feel like crap. They're walking away feeling, you know, and I thought, I don't want to be that person. 
So I'm going to concentrate not to be that person. I don't know how not to be, but if I put it out there and chant about it, I will consistently get better at not being that person. So the same thing is true with my career. I, I you know, like I said, I think I have one more time at bat. Mm. I think, yeah. And I think you've got, I think you're, you've got it. I think not just that one time at bat, but it was, yeah, you're kind of figuring out. I know you don't have it all figured out. No, but that's the point. Nobody does and you never will. And you don't want to because then where do you go from here? Right. right? And if you could figure it out, you'd have done it before now. Yeah, that too. But also like your life would be so boring if you had it all figured out of already. Of course, of course. And there are more things. It's not like there's just one, everything is to be figured out. There's one set amount of things to be figured out. It's like never ending. It's unlimited. Yeah. Well, I, I'm now living the life that I was not looking for a relationship. I was not. Well, I didn't think I was. Uh -huh. But my life was obviously ready for a relationship, even though I wasn't looking for it and it had to it had to come and knock on my forehead you know and you had to be open to it i had to be open to it and you know and i i ended up being open to it and look where you are now i'm in an interview in a strange hotel room <laughs> with a woman and her son who's masked like the lone ranger <laughs> and here we are so patrick i can't i really enjoy this thank oh, you so much so did i i feel like you were with me you went wherever i took you yes and I was, I was not threatened by it. Oh, good. I was not insecure. How was the wall situation? Well, the wall was insignificant. I'm sure it was still there, but it never became an issue. I never felt I had to drop the wall. Uh, I never felt you were trying to find out something that I wasn't comfortable saying in the first place. You know, mm -hmm. I think that wall is a self-protective measure at times. Mm -hmm. And it's just, a, it's a learned process. You know, I, I didn't, start in 1976 knowing how to do an interview. I didn't know how to do an interview. And I, I said a lot of just not awful things, but just stupid things. Like what? Well, I don't even know. It's oh. just like when I would read the interview, I go, you sound like a 14 year old, you know, reject from a Cub Scout troop or something. I mean, I just, <laughs> you have your television show. You should be sound, at least sound smarter than that. Oh, and that's that when the monitoring started. Yeah. And then I went, no, no, you just got to think better about oh, things before okay. you go. You know, and I try, this is just little things. I try not to say, um, or like, like I, you know, like, it's like when you like go to the like store and then you're like, um, you get in your car and you're like driving, you know, um, you know, um, well, you know, you're like just driving, you know, um, did that answer the question? <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> Like, I so, say like too, so I hear you. Well, so I'll uh, be editing something, a conversation, be like, oh, I just said like, but I'll be like. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and what I've found is I sort of physically don't say it, but I'll, I'll use a pause instead of a like. Not having to think I have to fill the space with sound like right now. And the word like is acceptable if it's a, a simile, if you're using yeah, it as like a comparative, uh -huh. you know, I walked down the street like I owned the whole road. Sure. That's like used properly. But I'll tell you what, sometimes when I, I when I first started doing the show, I would hear myself say stupid things and sound stupid like you're saying. I'd That's be like, it. oh, why did I say that? So I would take it out, edit it out. And then after a while I learned, I'm not sure how, I don't even remember how, that sometimes those things, if I leave them in, they're more relatable mm -hmm. because people actually feel like, oh, okay, they, they are seeing the real me well, and that you're, helps. you're not trying to be Barbara Walters. No, well, nothing wrong with Barbara Walters. No, no, but I mean, her, her interviews are, you know, the product of her being in the news business mm -hmm. her entire life. Yeah. I mean, and she is, robotically prepared when she does an interview and and that serves her very well sure but it's not this comfort factor of kind of interview and you would be hard pressed to get the response from your interviewees if you came into it with that yeah thing. i mean that's why there's a fine line between the research and not doing research because in a way it's really best if i can just get to know you on the spot but still, I need research to know some things. Research is important. It's just that it doesn't need to be exhibited as research. I know, but I like it to be all authentic. So if I'm hearing a story, I would like to really be reacting to the story too. But I said it. I knew the Irish Spring story. Yeah. 
So, you know, you just fess up, yeah. but you still have to get I the probably story. didn't drop any new pearls on you in terms <laughs> of, I'm, you know. Speaking of pearls. Oh, my Linda, yeah. All right, Patrick, thank you so much again. Is it over? Well, not quite. Okay. <laughs> See, now I feel like I want to co-star in a show with you so that we can become besties. Well, or we can do a show together. Oh, yeah. That's Remember, you can watch me and Patrick right now on my YouTube channel. Just head to youtube.com slash really famous. And remember to tap the notifications bell so you know whenever I drop a new celebrity interview. If you missed my talk with Suzanne Summers or haven't listened in a while, I recommend it. There's a link to that episode, plus links to other talks that Patrick and I just mentioned, including Henry Winkler, Christopher Knight, and The Real with Jason Ritter. You'll also find links to my Instagram where you can see fun photos of Patrick and me, plus that highlight reel. Thanks again to the Culver Hotel. Thank you to you for supporting the show, sharing your feedback with me, donating, shopping with my Amazon links, and just being you. I'm Kara. Talk to you very soon. Uh, then what I will also do is, is give you uh, my email address. That would that. be nice. And I would love to stay in touch because, you know, that's who I really am and how I really feel about you. Okay. So. Well, you're not getting invited to Thanksgiving dinner, so. Ah, well, it's okay. I host Thanksgiving myself. Okay. Well, actually, we got out of it this year. Right. I usually go to my sisters in the, in the desert, the families, my boys and their mm -hmm. wives and children, and we all gather down there. And Linda was going to go this last year. And then, of course, there was no Thanksgiving. So we're going to do it this year. Everybody's vaxxed. Mm, and, that's so good. You yeah. know, and once we're there, we never leave mm -hmm. the house and the property. So we have three or four days and it's perfect. Grandkids get to play and all of that. So I love that. Yeah. So anyway, so I'll do a testimonial for you. Now. Oh, you do a testimonial. So look at the camera. I know how to well, do them. <laughs> God, it's like it's my first interview. Really? Yeah. Thank you for that. He gave you the eye roll. I, know, I deserve it. I deserve it. Yeah, it's I forget. <laughs> who I'm dealing with, a pro. I'm not gonna tell you anything. Okay. Hello, this is Patrick Duffy. I just finished one of my favorite interviews of my entire 50 years in the business. Um, it was more than comfortable, uh, over the top entertaining with somebody that I look forward to talking to again. It's, uh, what's your name? I, about this tall hair and kind of smiles a lot. <laughs> I don't know, I've done so many of these. <laughs> they all look the same. But anyway, you should tune in, whoever she is. You'll, you'll enjoy it, maybe, kind of. Well, probably not, but anyway, I'm, I got a free glass of water. He hit all my things, right? <laughs> you hit it all the beginning, all the, they were all, all very nice compliments oh. <laughs> that I appreciate everything you said. I'm on 10, I'll bet you it's a quarter to three. It's three, 11. Okay. Whoa, okay. That's good. I'm so glad you said before three. Yeah, is, is, that, it, is like, it six oh. o'clock? <laughs> that would be a really bad sign. Okay. So that's perfect. Well, you got a lot of editing to do, my dear.